My name is Irving Wender, and I'm one of the few people I, who are in catalysis, perhaps, who was born on the island of Manhattan. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed away when I was about one year old, and although I had a mother, I was um, raised in an orphan home some 30 miles north of New York City in a place called Tuckahoe. When I, I came back to the city at about 12 and went to a high school called DeWitt Clinton High School, which had the enormous number of pupils, had an enormous number, had over 10,000 students. And uh, when I graduated while in that high school, I think my career was chosen for me by uh, a chemistry teacher named uh, Dr. Witsit. He spelled it W-H-I-T-S-I-T. -I, I remember him well. He had a sort of a white uh, goatee, very distinguished gentleman. And he and um, one or two other authors had written a high school chemistry book. And in later years, I found the book in an old bookstore, and I still own it in his honor. He told me one day that he thought, uh, he asked me if I considered going into chemistry as a career, and while at the time I hadn't thought of going into anything as a career, I, I was influenced by that. And then he asked me to teach a class one day. Uh, you know, he asked me for a teacher class in a, in a week or so. Well, I, 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 at the time, I, it was very hard for me to speak before a group of people, and so I, I used to blush a lot, and uh, it, it was difficult, but I had to agree since it was a command performance, and I think I gave probably one of the worst lectures anyone ever heard on whatever subject it was. But he did have his influence, because after that, I could only see one career, and that was to major in chemistry, which I have pursued and did. After high school, I enrolled in the City College of New York, which at that time was a free school. I think it still is. I'm not sure about it. The only fee we had to pay was a chemistry breakage fee at the end of the year. Um, and I studied chemistry, and uh, it was a good school, and I liked it. And from there, I went to um, Columbia University for a master's degree. Uh, but uh, I did finish all my course requirements and everything for the degree, but I had hoped to get a PhD and did not take the qualifying examination because I entered the Army. That was during World War I. And um, even for the master's degree, you have to take the same qualifying examination. So I left without really getting a degree at the time and uh, entered the Army. It, it turns out I later did get the degree from Columbia University, and I'll tell you about it. Uh, in the Army, I was uh, put on a 90 millimeter aircraft gun for about a year in uniform then asked to take a special test uh, given to thousands of people uh, called the ASAP Advanced, hmm, whatever I said that, whatever it was, Advanced, AT, ASTP Advanced Training, something or other. Anyway, I took this test and was classified as an advanced chemical engineer, although I was a chemist and sent to VPI, Virginia Polytech Institute, in, um, um, where is that? Blacksburg. Oh, Blacksburg, Virginia. Very pretty place. I was sent there just, I was told I'd be there a week and then be reassigned somewhere. Well, almost a year later, I was still there. <laughs> Which reminds me, um, oh, I, I was put on a, um, I was put to work with a Professor Vilbrandt, who was a very famous chemical engineer, 
uh, running up and down just like some columns, which didn't seem to be very worthwhile. And so I left that, and I was allowed to enroll in whatever I wanted. And so I enrolled in bacteriology courses, taking in that year of all the courses they had to offer, including graduate courses. And believe it or not, getting a small grant from a AAAS to do research. But that ended because at the end of the year, I, 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 by the time that came through, I left. While I was at uh, BPI, I, I don't know why it's not important, but I did have a touch football game where I jumped up for a pass and my head hit someone else's head. My wife had, had come down to BPI because I'd been down there for so long. And I, I um, felt fine. But I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was put into a hospital and asked what my name was. Well, I knew my name. I was asked what my army serial number was. Well, I three two four one two three three two six one two three four eight. I knew it perfectly. And then I was asked whether I was married. I was, but I could not remember. I said, I think so. And uh, they said, well, if you are, what's your wife's name? Well, I couldn't remember that. My wife was never forgiven. But after a day or so, I regained my memory and things were all right. And then one day, about a year later, um, went out for, they called out some names, and they called my name out and said I was being assigned to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, my wife, who was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, raised it there in Tennessee, um, I asked her where Oak Ridge was, and she said she never heard of the place. And I said, that's the way they teach geography in Tennessee. But of course, Oak Ridge had never existed before the war, and there was really no way she could have known. But I was shipped along with eight people to the University of Chicago where I was supposed to be, where I was really assigned to Oak Ridge, but supposed to be liaison between the University of Chicago Metallurgical Lab, which is working on the atom bomb, and, um, and Oak Ridge. Uh, when I arrived in Chicago, I was met, I was ushered into an office, in uniform, I was in uniform, army uniform, I was ushered into an office with uh, Captain Baranowski, introduced himself as such, uh, dressed in civilian clothes, and um, which is rather amazing. And uh, he said that uh, I'm in charge of this project, and all of you will have to get into civilian clothes too. And so he, he put the five of us up in a hotel, Hotel Miramar, a small hotel in Chicago South Side. And I called my mother and asked her to sell, send my civilian clothes to Chicago. And she, she wanted to know why, and I said I couldn't tell her. She said, well, you must be, you must be, are in the process of being discharged. And I said, no. And she said, well, then are you going to be a spy? I said, no. And then she said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I can't tell you. The fact is, I really didn't know at the time what I was going to be. Anyway, um, she finally did send them, and as it so happens, we had to stay in a hotel, could not leave, had to eat our meals there for about 18 days. It was, it was really an ordeal. But three of us got our clothes on the same day, and we got dressed in civilian clothes. After a year in the Army, uh, it felt very odd to be walking the streets in civilian clothes. We all needed haircuts, so we marched down to a barber shop, uh, had two chairs and two of us getting haircuts, so one of us was sitting there, feeling very self-conscious, and the barber suddenly turned to us and said, are you fellows in the army? And we said, why do you ask? He said, you're all wearing army socks. And I could see that we never were meant to be spies because we would never have done that, but we were. It, it was a surprise that he was so observant. Anyway, um, I was put to work. Uh, my duties were to prepare 
volatile, carrier-free, volatile uh, fission products. The main ones were iodine, which were coming out of the smokestack at Hanford, and ruthenium tetroxide, which is volatile, and it was also coming out of the smokestacks at Hanford. So I had to dissolve uranium slugs and um, exposed to enormous amounts of radiation, of radiation probably millions of times more than you're allowed today. Uh, we did have badges that were discharged instantly when we answered the laboratory. I worked in a, in a place called Site B, which was an old brewery converted to a laboratory. And I also worked uh, in under the, the stands of the Chicago Stadium. In fact, right opposite the room where the first reactor still existed, had a big sign do not enter. I tried to force my way in several times, but I never made it. I never saw the reactor, which is probably a good thing. Anyway, I did I did prepare uh, carrier-free radioiodine, and, and after a while, ruthenium tetroxide, and gave it to these biology people who um, had different animals, mostly white rats, mice, and sometimes larger animals, inhale them. It was an inhalation division, and their duties were to see what effect inhalation of radioactive materials was. They would, I would prepare them, and they would anesthetize these animals, and the vapors would go down the long manifold, and these animals were anesthetized, and they would breathe in the iodine or the tetroxide, ruthenium tetroxide. Then they would cut up the animals and look at the various parts, the liver, uh, the pancreas, or what have you, and uh, see where the radioactive materials uh, resided and for how long they resided. Um, iodine, it turns out, as we all know now, went directly to the thyroid and stayed there. The half-life of iodine is eight days, about eight days. But it would go to the thyroid and then quickly eliminate it in the urine. So for a while there, you could irradiate the thyroid with, with iodine very well. Uh, I don't remember what the distribution of ruthenium was, but it wasn't as as definite. It was it was more well distributed. Uh, I knew that that osmium tetroxide is very toxic, and I prepared large amounts of inactive and radioactive uh, ruthenium tetroxide. And in an experiment we ran, we ran non-radioactive, ordinary ruthenium tetroxide, uh, which I fed, which I generated, and it was put into a chamber with a lot of little mice running around. And we wondered what would happen to them since the osmium tetroxide was so toxic. Well, these mice got covered with black ruthenium, and none of them died. They seemed to be quite happy. And but if, if ruthenium tetroxide is toxic, it's not nearly so toxic as osmium tetroxide. Well, while I was there, we I did notice that um, other sections were irradiating uh, fruit flies, small things with huge amounts of radiation, and they were able to with practically no change, and discovered that the larger the animal, the less was the amount of radiation needed to, to do them harm. The more differentiated an animal was, the easier it was. So that while um, you could give 10,000 rats to a fruit fly, 300 uh, did a dog, almost, almost did a dog in. So we realized that man is very susceptible to radiation. Um, what, what I think the most important thing that happened, and something that really, I think, affected my entire scientific career, though, was a weekly, I don't even remember whether it was twice weekly, seminars held in which the soldiers, there were about 60 soldiers in civilian clothes, and we did not reveal that we were in civilian clothes, who attended these seminars, and I 
had a seat assigned to me on a little couch next to a, the Nobel Prize winner, James Franck, who was a very nice gentleman and very kind to me, I remember him well. And uh, what I saw in, in, um, in these seminars was the, the, the terrific battle as it went on between scientists, mostly physicists, um, Yuri, Burton, Milton Burton, um, a, a whole bunch of people, uh, perhaps a large should show up, who uh, fought, I would say, viciously about certain points and weren't very uh, nice about it to each other. I had always considered science to be sort of a gentleman's calling and was surprised, impressed, and really delighted at the way they fought with each other, deriding each other's theories, asking for proof, and realized that really very little was understood about anything. And their, their attitudes, they used to come in from different directions, I think rubbed off on me and influenced uh, how I felt about science. Um, perhaps I would have felt that way anyway, I don't know. But it, I know that, it, that those, those years were very influential. There was a book at the time by Hevesy and Paneth, uh, which described it, it, the, the, a lot of radioactive um, experiments in different chapters. And there was one chapter that actually dealt with the fission of uranium. And uh, there were about eight chapters in the book, and eight of us were chosen to present one chapter each to this a bunch of high-powered physicists, and by the luck of the draw, I got the chapter on the fission of uranium, which didn't make me happy because I was awed by getting up in front of these people and trying to tell them what was happening. But I had to do it, and did, and they were, to me anyway, they were very sweet and gentlemanly, and after I sat down, the fight started among each other and talking to each other. And I was uh, unhurt and unscathed, but it, it, it went on again. Uh, after we, we did this, they auctioned off the book, uh, and I won the lottery, and I have the book to this day, with the signatures of the people, I think, who, who, gave, the, who, who gave the several chapters. Um, near the end, I, I remember thinking that the atom bomb when I heard. By the way, I was told the very first day I came to work, I worked for a fellow named Richard Abrams, who was a very young um, PhD. I think he got his PhD at 19 or 20 from the University of Chicago. He was ahead of my group. Um, and, and when he came to work, uh, he took me in his office and explained the entire project and the bomb, what it, how it was going to be made, and what it was for. And I was stunned and uh, surprised by the whole picture. And I never really believed it would work. And I remember the day when someone rushed into the laboratory and said that they had dropped this bomb and it had gone off uh, into Hiroshima. By the way, it was interesting that before they dropped the bomb, uh, they had a vote in the laboratory. Um, there were 10 choices. The tenth choice was throw the bomb into the river, make out, uh, I mean, just destroy everything, don't work on the bomb, and it doesn't exist to make out, it's all something you don't want anything to do. I don't think, maybe some people voted for that. Number one was drop the bomb, period. I think we only had two bombs, so uh, we didn't have too much choice, but very few people voted for that. Number two, which practically everybody voted for, and I certainly did, was invite the Japanese to come to an island, drop the bomb, let them see the damage it did, and give them a week or so to surrender. Obviously, they did not do this. One of the reasons they did it only had two bombs, and they were slightly different. But when they went ahead, and when it did go up, did work, I, I was surprised. And about a week after the first bomb, when it was dropped in Hiroshima, 
we were told to go back into uniform. I had been getting a staff sergeant's pay, by the way, and all the, the uh, perks that a, a staff sergeant got. My mother got some money, uh, whatever. The one thing I have against the Army, they owe me some money to this day. They were supposed to pay me for the use of my civilian clothes, and I have a letter to that effect. They never honored it. <laughs> so the U.S. government owes me some money, but I don't think I'll bother to collect it. Because <laughs> they didn't pay for this pretty good. But uh, we showed up one day, all 60 of us, um, in, in uniform, and people said, what happened to you? The war's almost over and you've been drafted. I don't know, or something. And I said, no, 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 we've been soldiers all along. I, I left out one part, and that is I, I said I was assigned to Oak Ridge as liaison between Chicago and Oak Ridge, and I was not assigned to the University of Chicago. And sure enough, uh, one day I was uh, told uh, to, uh, to bring a sample to Oak Ridge from Chicago. And so I set off with this sample, took a train at 63rd Street Station, and headed off in a blinding snowstorm toward Tennessee, Oak Ridge. And the train had gone about 10 to 15 miles when it, it just couldn't go any further because of the snow. And so it backed all the way into Chicago. And I returned without ever seeing Oak Ridge. And about six weeks later, they called up and they said, no, you have to go down Oak Ridge and bring back a, a radioactive sample of xenon. Um, so I was all ready to go. When a call came, said the sample was not ready, don't come down. And after that, everybody forgot that I was assigned to Oak Ridge. And I, I became part of the Chicago contingent. My name somehow appeared on their records. Uh, and, and just to put a period to that, when I was discharged from the Army, uh, I was given a discharge certificate, which I still have, which declares that although I was discharged, discharged from Camp Grant, Wisconsin, the certificate I have, my discharge, says, discharge from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I have never to this day been to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. <laughs> oh, I was assigned to them for three years. <laughs> anyway, from while I was at uh, Chicago, I wrote to Columbia telling them I would like to take the qualifier for the PhD and the master's, and, um, and in fact had arranged to work for my PhD with Dave Rittenberg in um, on mass spectrometry in the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia, and he had accepted me. Uh, they sent the examination, and uh, I took it, uh, walked in with a slide rule. The officer in charge had a letter saying, saying I was allowed to take nothing but pen and paper, and he wouldn't allow me in with the slide rule. He called Columbia, and they said it was okay. Anyway. I took the examination and they, they sent me, they said, you now have a master's degree. And uh, that was that. And while I was at the, at the Chicago, um, a, a fellow named Ben Ferber uh, worked with me and he had worked for the Bureau of Mines in, right outside of Pittsburgh at a place called Brewston. Turns out that Hammett and Kistiakowski were working at Bruce Allen Explosives. Uh, I had never heard of the place, but he said they were looking for people for um, an energy project. And so I wrote to a Dr. Storch, who headed the lab, about a job when I could see the end that I was going to be discharged one of these days. And I got an answer, traveled down to Pittsburgh, and uh, was told that if I wanted a job, I could work there with a, with a Dr. Milton Orchard. And uh, so we moved to Pittsburgh, uh, my wife and I, and um, I, I went to work with, I came to work uh, approximately the same day as Keith Hall, who is now and has been for a long time the editor of the Journal of Catalysis. And he went upstairs, it turns out, to work for Robert Anderson on the fish trophy reaction, and I was sent downstairs to work on the origin on homogeneous catalysis and organic chemistry. 
uh, and that determined both our lives. Uh, I, I, part of the deal in going to the Bureau of Mines with Dr. Storch was that he told me, I told my mother to get a PhD, and they said they had an arrangement with the University of Pittsburgh whereby I could uh, get my degree with a joint sponsorship between the uh, Bureau of Mines and the University uh, on some project that Bill agreed in, and I had all my tuition paid by the GI Bill of Rights, and in fact, they accepted all my credits from Columbia. So I got there, and everything worked out just as he said. Uh, uh, they let me go to, to classes during the day. They did everything possible, and they were really very nice. And um, the project I worked on uh, was told to me by Dr. Orchin, who later went to the University of Cincinnati. And he said there was some reaction discovered by the Germans while they were working on the fish and trophy reaction. It involved an ocean. He wasn't quite sure what it was. And uh, at that time, we had a lot of captured German documents and also some captured German scientists who were working in the Bureau. And uh, I soon discovered that it basically was the hydroformylation reaction or oxo reaction, which was the conversion uh, reaction of olefins for synthesis gas, CO and hydrogen to form aldehydes and alcohols. And that uh, became the subject of my thesis. Uh, first thing I did was did I read the German literature, although my German is very bad, and wrote a, what the Bureau calls the Report of Investigations, which still exists. I, I have a copy of it anyway, in which I outlined what was known and what I was going to do, and even suggested that it would be a very good idea that although the Germans had used the cobalt for this reaction, rhodium would be a very likely uh, candidate as a catalyst for this hydroformylation. Of course, today rhodium is used in most of the new plants. But I never tried rhodium because we could we considered rhodium would be too expensive uh, to ever be used. Uh, of course, it is too expensive, but it's recovered in very high yield. Um, it was really a marvelous subject to be working on because little was known about this entire field of metal carbonyls, um, organometallic complexes, catalysis, binders, homogeneous um, uh, metal complexes, the relationship to heterogeneous catalysts, the relationship to fischer tropsch which seemed to be seems to be a homogeneous version of fischer tropsch in some ways. And so um, we started work, and I think that one of the first things we did was work out the kinetics of the oxo reaction. Oxo is another term for the hydroformylation reaction, and published these results. Uh, they were later duplicated by other people, and uh, the, we use we compare terminal olefins rates with. They all seem to be about the same, with internal olefins, which were about a third of the rate, uh, with branched olefins, with cyclic olefins. And um, later on, people did the same uh, kinetic work with rhodium, and we found that the rates were much faster with rhodium, but comparable in terms of the structure of the olefin. And this has persisted and is being, being used. Luckily, uh, the and I'm not, not exactly luckily, but we did not know at the time, although we could have imagined it, the hydroformylation reaction became a very important industrial reaction. And the, and the kinetics and the mechanism and the things that worked out were used, and there were over 10 billion pounds of, of hydroformylation products made today in most countries of the world, actually. So it turned out to be very useful, although if you, if you want to know the driving force of the research, we always use it, we used to say that we're trying to get at the mechanism of the fischer tropsch reaction. That was the reason they allowed us to work on this. While we worked on this, um, many, many things happened that were of interest. One thing was, uh, every once in a while we would 
we would come up with a solid organometallic complex, often by accident. Uh, as a, for instance, I asked a technician once, uh, I suggested they said, look, instead of running an olefin, why don't we run an acetylene? It has a triple bond instead of a double bond. Perhaps one double, one double bond will hydrogenate, and then another will hydroformulate. And I said, just take hexine, one hexine, put it in, say, heptane or benzene, didn't matter, and nothing will happen. Throw it into an autoclave, and um, let's see what the products are. Well, he came walking across the hall with an oil Meyer flask with gas gushing from the thing, trying very hard to keep the lid on it. And he, he said, I, 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 I think something is happening. And I, I looked at this gas, and while I looked, I, a, an oil formed, and um, later were able to crystallize this thing. And it turned out to be the first organometallic complex of a hydrocarbon. And uh, we published this with, with, with what we thought was a structure from IR, UV, and, and of course the alpha analysis. And the structure, I think, the structure was correct. And uh, I remember getting a letter from Linus Pauling, which I wish I had saved, um, sort of congratulating us on getting such an unusual complex, the first of its kind. I also got a letter from Jeff Will Jeffrey, Jeff Wilkinson saying um, that he he was on the verge of discovering this complex, but <laughs> which was kind of funny. Um, we also had another strange letter. There was a German inorganic chemist at the University of Munich, uh, Walter Heber. He, he was really an excellent chemist, and he was publishing uh, on methods of making the methyl carbonyls and their anions. Uh, his work was superb. It, it, it is lasted in the literature to this day. And uh, but his letter when he saw some of the articles we were putting into print, arrived and said that he had seen our papers and we didn't have to work on this, this problem anymore because he was taking care of all possible reactions. And um, we, of course, we couldn't pay attention to this because the number of complexes in literature is, is now in the many thousands and publications and advances in organometallic chemistry and what have you. There are journals now. But obviously, Walter Heber uh, appreciated that. Um, although he was, he was doing superb work, didn't appreciate what was coming. Uh, I went to see him in Munich later, and he was very nice. I think he had cancer at the time. But he, was, he, he, did, he showed no animosity at all, and we talked about our work. And uh, I congratulated him on his contributions, which were many. Um, later on, we, we, we made several new complexes. I say often by accident. We made an ion quinone, an ion tricarbonyl quinone complex, which is the first of its kind. Then we, we made one, this one somewhat by accident, uh, which is the first cluster compound a cluster having at least three metal atoms, as defined by most people. And this was a, a tricobalt enneocarbonyl with three of the cobalts attached to one carbon atom, and the carbon atom was attached to a, a, a methyl CH3C, the C attached to three cobalt atoms. We tried to determine the structure of this unusual complex and uh, enlisted the aid of Al Cotton at MIT to do uh, the, in, the instrumental I worked on it. He evidently assigned this to a student. A paper appeared with its structure based on the NMR along with other data. The structure was incorrect because the NMR had been interpreted incorrectly. And um, many papers immediately appeared correcting our structure. We have many references in the literature because we published this incorrect structure. Years later, 
I had lunch with uh, Al Cotton in Pittsburgh and John Yates. I was going to bring this up about the NMR interpretation, but Al Cotton did, and um, he said, we really did you in, but uh, it, it really didn't matter. Anyway, we had a decision to make at this time was, are we going to work on organometallic complexes, or are we going to work in catalysis? And we made uh, a decision that we would not, the complexes were interesting, but our aim was catalysis. So Larry Dahl, who was then starting in at Wisconsin, um, had read some of our papers and he showed up. And we handed him all set of complexes that we had made and he determined their X-ray structures and he's been doing work like that ever since very well. Um, we turned away from olefins at this time. We, we said, is, a, is an olefin the only substance that will uh, be catalyzed by the, 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 the carbonyls in the same way, in other words, adding the carbon, the carbon monoxide chain lengthening. And one of the substances we used, for instance, was benzyl alcohol, which does not contain a double bond. And we found, indeed, that this, um, some of it, hydrogen tonumine, but um, a good part of it did undergo an homologation, which is a chain lengthening reaction. And we converted benzyl alcohol into phenethyl alcohol. This gave us a chance to see what the effect of um, electron releasing and electron attracting groups in a parent position of benzyl alcohol would, would have, a, have on the rate of hydrogenation or chain lengthening. And we found that electron releasing groups like methoxy in the parent position favored the formation of, of the, the phenethyl alcohol, in other words, CO added. But electron attracting groups like fluorine um, reduced, uh, gave you mostly uh, parafluoro uh, tonuing. Um, we, we thought this might be a carbonium ion reaction but I'm not sure that it wasn't a free radical reaction. We also found that hydrocarbons, um, such as anthocene, were reduced to 910 by hydroanthocene, and uh, very easily, essentially quantitatively. But for the anthrene, for some reason, it was reduced with difficulty. Uh, we took a whole row of polynuclear hydrocarbons and found that they were all reduced, they all added hydrogen to give one of, of two structures. They would either give, you, either give you a structure with one benzene ring or, or a phenanthrene ring. For instance, naphthalene would give you tetralin, but pyrene would, would add two hydrogens to give you a phenanthrene structure. You don't have to write that out to see that. Perylene, you know, this structure properly, not even for anyone giving you a hexahydroperylene and leave a phenanthrene light structure. So you could predict what was happening. We even, we started to reduce coal with it and we found that a good bit of hydrogen added. Uh, the reaction was very, very slowly uh, affected by sulfur, so the sulfur in coal really didn't uh, make much difference. If you let it go long enough, there's a slow reaction which converts, say, cobalt carbonate onto a cobalt sulfide, which is not, um, does not, thermodynamically is very stable, and uh, would not be converted to a carbonyl even under high pressure. But really, it's essentially, you can, you can say it was not affected by sulfur. And in fact, we, Bill Dorton and I, have two patents on the reduction of thiophene to uh, tetrahydrothiophene called thiolene uh, with cobalt carbonyl and syngas. So we were actually reducing a sulfur carbon. We tried other, other non-olefinic uh, uh, compounds such as acetals, orthoformates, and ethers, and found in most cases they would react to form, uh, to, to add a carbon monoxide in a certain way, which is no sense going into. Uh, 
um, and found that the necessary condition was that somehow or other a metal carbon bond had to be formed. Actually, and once a metal carbon bond was formed, then a CO would generally undergo um, an insertion um, between the metal and the carbon. Um, a migratory insertion, in other words, the alkyl group would migrate uh, to a CO group. So that if we had, say, uh, CH3 uh, cobalt carbonyl, the CH3 group would migrate to one of the COs, terminal COs, and we would get um, uh, acetyl cobalt carbonyl. This has been, was worked out by the a group, Clausen and, and others, at uh, with manganese uh, and Colorado also worked on this. Uh, showing that um, if you had manganese carbonyl and treated it with radioactive CO, if you had methyl manganese carbonyl plus radioactive CO, you would end up with acetyl, not even with CO, with acetyl manganese pentacarbonyl, but that the CO that migrated, if you used radioactive CO, the CO that migrated into the methyl manganese bond was not radioactive, showing that what really happened was a CH3 group had migrated to one of the COs, and then the vacant orbital where that CH3 had disappeared from uh, was replaced by a, a non-reactive, unradioactive CO from the gas phase. That's too complicated, and probably can cut it out. We, in, a, in the course of other studies, which are related, we discovered that uh, we could put carbon phthalic anhydride uh, into this reaction just with radioactive CO and find that the COs, CO groups of phthalic anhydride became radioactive, which meant that uh, the CO O bond in phthalic anhydride was split and that a phenyl CO um, cobalt bond had been formed, and once that happened, you had exchange between the two groups and the CO between the phenyl and the manganese. Um, that went on for some time, and then along about um, 53, Milton Orchin, Dr. Orchin, left to go to the University of Cincinnati, and I was um, selected by Dr. Storch, who was head of the laboratory. Dr. Storch was a, had gotten his PhD at Caltech with Lewis and Lewis and Randall, and his, his, um, he was a contemporary of Murray and um, a few other people on that ilk, and he's, he's a sharp physical chemist, given when he was, he was a very fine man, but he could get angry. When he was angry, he, he knew how to, to, to let you know a lot of nice words. Um, anyway, he called me up to his office and said that um, Dr. Orson has left and we want you to head the uh, chemistry section. And um, I had been working with nice, clean synthesis gas complexes and felt very happy about it and things were going very well. Uh, so I asked him a very foolish question. I said, do I have to work with that, with coal? And he let out a string of words which let me know in no uncertain terms that I certainly had to work with coal. And how? Well, I did. We, we explored all kinds of um, different reactions. Uh, we found that we could reduce coal at room temperature, essentially, with metal amine systems. And we produced from a very high rank coal uh, a substance that was heavily hydrogenated and was almost was light tan in color. Uh, I still have a sample of it. And um, I finally decided that people were hydrogenating coal to liquids. And I knew that there were hydroaromatic systems in coal. So we embarked upon a way of dehydrogenating coal to get hydrogen. And after much 
anguish research for over a year with nothing happening, we found that if you used um, a nitrogen compound such as phenanthrene, which is phenanthrene with one nitrogen uh, replacing carbon, uh, these nitrogen compounds have very low reduction potentials. Uh, one day when this was used as a solvent, an enormous amount of um, hydrogens coming off from the coal and, and turned out to be an over 95% uh, hydrogen. Um, and what happened, of course, was that the coal itself, the hydromatics, transferred hydrogen to to the sub, so the solvent, which has a low reduction potential, and then the palladium catalyst uh, attacked this and dehydrogenated the substrate. And we found that you could get as much as 10,000 cubic feet of hydrogen per ton of coal, which was interesting but not economical, but gave us a, a good idea of coal structure because we could tell how much hydroaromatic material was present. We worked on many um, reactions of coal at this time, reductive alkylation with Heinz Sternberg uh, and Mel Dorchen. Uh, one, one interesting reaction coming back to synthesis gas again was uh, in looking over the mechanism of this reaction we theorized that the real catalyst, if I can call that, was probably cobalt hydrocarbon, you know, H cobalt CO, H cobalt CO4. And uh, so we synthesized this cobalt hydrocarbon, which is an unstable gas, and passed it into a just a test tube of hexene contained in the inert solid, like benzene or some hydrocarbon, saturated hydrocarbon. We used hexene because I had read that heptaldehyde was the compound that was most easily detected by the human nose. Perhaps something else has been found since then, but at that time I, I felt we could do our analysis by just smelling the compound. Anyway, we passed at room temperature, we simply passed a little bit of hydrocarbonyl into hexene, and sure enough, you could take one whiff, and the hip down the height smell was very, very pronounced. So we knew that the hydroformylation reaction, which takes place ordinarily at 150 to 180 degrees, and 3,000 pounds psi of syngas, we could conduct it at atmospheric, under atmospheric conditions if we simply used a, a single compound of cobalt hydrocarbonyl and the oil, which gave us a good clue. Didn't give us, it didn't unleash the mechanism of the, of the reaction, although it helped considerably. And we worked on the mechanism of the reaction. We realized that uh, the CO uh, had to be that you had to have an unsaturated orbital for a reaction to occur. This was that if you had a fully um, saturated carbonyl, there was no place for the olefin to get in. And the, it turns out that the, the kinetics of the hydroformylation reaction is inversely proportional to the CO concentration. And so it really told us that the CO was evolved from either cobalt or hydrocarbonyl to leave an empty orbital for the entry. I won't go into that anymore. Um, after that, uh, uh, I was in the position of heading this section for a while when uh, the head of uh, the Bureau of Mines at that time was divided into two parts. We were the energy part, and we had a director whose name was Richard Corey, and uh, the other part was had a, its own director. And they were interested in the health and safety uh, of mines and miners. And they still exist today. They are the Bureau of Mines. We became the energy division of the Bureau of Mines. Later we became IRDA. Later we became the Department of Energy. But one day after Mr. Corey went to Washington, um, 
we had no director, and they sent some man up from Utah to be an interim director. And he came down to me one day and said he was leaving for a couple of days, but I just look over this the station, take care of it. And he did that a few times, and then he went away for two months and uh, said, why don't you, you know, just see, take care of the station. And then Tom Henry came down from Washington. I, I don't remember his position, but it was some high up position in the Department of Interior, and told me that I was going to be director of the laboratory. I really objected because I felt I wanted to stay with research. Um, I also said there were too many chemical engineers, and I was a chemist. And his reply was that chemical engineers need a chemist to keep them straight. It's probably true, I think. <laughs> anyway, I did become director of the laboratory, and at that time everybody was hired to do research. It was a very prolific laboratory. Dr. Storch had hired some wonderful people uh, right after the war. Bob Anderson, who became professor of chemical engineering at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. Um, Martin Elliott, who became vice president of IIT. Um, Milton Orchard, who became head of the department at the University of Cincinnati. Milt Manners, who became professor at Kent State University. Saul Weller became head of the chemical engineering department at Buffalo. and. Um, Gus Friedel was a super spectroscopist. Uh, I can go on forever, but there were some just tremendously talented people. And not only did somehow Storch have an eye for good people, but he encouraged them. He would sit down at lunch and talk to you about your project. And um, it was always very optimistic, very encouraging. Um, although he himself uh, was interested in the direct liquefaction of coal and in the Fischer-Tropsch reaction. At that time, Bob Anderson, who had done been, was doing basic work on coal liquefaction, had a barrel a day plant, the Fischer-Tropsch plant, going. And interestingly enough, people from South Africa visited our barrel a day plant very often. And I think we helped them. I hope we helped them. Uh, a fair amount in their CESOL work. Anyway, we, we kept in very good touch with them and uh, exchanged information along this line. Later, um, the plants were built in Missouri, in a little town called Louisiana, Missouri, uh, of, of some decent size. A Fisher Tropes plant was built based on German chemistry, German processes and a Burgess coal liquefaction plant. And these operated for some time. They were very cheap compared to today's, today's prices. And Dr. Storch really made that his main interest, although all these other projects are going on on the side. Um, but um, during the Eisenhower, Eisenhower administration, um, the President Eisenhower decided that uh, there was certainly enough oil to go around, and we didn't need this research. And he, he wiped out the plants and actually let the people go who were working there. So that was the end of that. Um, let's see. I, I, after that, um, I, while I was director, by the way, I always kept a little group working with me doing some research so that I managed to never to, to lose out on the research part. And um, I was director from 72 to about 79. And everybody we hired, we hired to do research. But at this time, Washington decided that uh, this was during my heyday where I must admit money because of the gas lines and what was happening during the oil embargo, money was being thrown somewhat at energy research. Um, money that was allotted and monitored in Washington 
was sent out to Pittsburgh Energy and Technology Center, which of which I was director. Uh, and so the nature of the station changed somewhat in that when it was first announced that we're going to become contract monitors and monitors and managers, about 20-25% of the people thought that was a great idea and jumped over and leaped at the chance to become monitors. Uh, a great many people also objected to this, but since they offered a grade raise higher if you became a manager, uh, many people went over to do that. And I don't know what the ratio today is in the, in the energy technology centers. I imagine it may be 50-50, but I'm not sure. Now with 50% doing research, 50% uh, managing contracts. My impression is that the managing part is gaining over the research part. And the number of papers published has fallen considerably because of this. Um, then I went to Washington uh, for two years. I was replaced by, uh, my, by my deputy director. Um, and in Washington, I became uh, director of advanced research and technology development, which worried about basic research, had very good relationships with basic energy sciences, which was not, which were not in fossil energy. And um, while I hated Washington, uh, I found that I, I learned a lot. I, I used to resist going to Washington, but uh, I in fact refused to, to transfer to Washington and they allowed me to commute. I would go down on Monday, come back on Friday, and occasionally would stay two weeks, sometimes even longer. And I did that for two years. Uh, I discovered that while well, Washington was very interesting, uh, you needed a thick skin to survive. I had been told this, and indeed I noticed that my skin was getting thicker and thicker. And when it got so thick that I could stand up without any backbone at all, I knew I had arrived. And I think I also knew it was time to leave. I found that Washington was um, almost a daily budget exercise, which nobody listened to because the next day the budget changed. And just toward the end of the Carter administration, I, I resigned because it did not seem to be a very promising area. And um, I, I was given a party in Washington, I was given a party at Brewston, um, but I left. Uh, and when people asked me what I was going to do, I, I uh, since I really didn't, want, I didn't know, and I didn't have any good answer, I would tell them I was going to chase girls, mm. and that would usually stop the conversation. But I got a call from the University of Pittsburgh, Chem Engineering Department, from the dean, Max Williams, and he asked me what I was going to do, and I gave him my chase girls answer, and he said, "Oh, you don't want to do that." And he says, "Why don't you come to Pitt?" We have an office for you, and you can start in right away. I said, well, I've got a lot of cleaning up to do, and we haven't discussed this. He said, well, come on over and just, well, just come on over now is, is well into its seventh year. Uh, I'm still there. Um, probably will we'll stay there longer. It's almost a second career, which I hadn't counted on. And it's been very happy while I... People at Pitt thought, my gosh, Wendler knows all about proposals and he'll write proposals like mad. But I had never written one in my life. Uh, we got funds at, at the Bureau of Mines, which later became Erda, which later became Department of Energy. I kept in the same chair through all three agencies without moving as director. Uh, but I knew what a proposal should be like, and so the grants that I wrote, I was fairly successful. And just to prove that it wasn't DOE, I wrote a, uh, a grant proposal to the Department of Defense for a, a $400,000 mass spectrometer, NMR, I'm sorry, not a mass spectrometer. And um, it was granted. It, was, it wasn't um, 
I, I had to make no promises at all about using it in any manner at all, just as an instrument for general purposes. And uh, so I got a DOD grant um, for this. And I also did work for Electric Power Research Institute on carbon dioxide and uh, on synthesis gas chemistry. So things worked out rather well, and I enjoyed uh, working with students. I had master's and PhD students, still have them, and um, still writing proposals, and um, having, I guess, a, a good time, except that I really had expected when I went to Pitt to cut down on the amount of work that I was doing. Well, I hope perhaps to work, uh, shall we say, half time or something like that. But I soon found that I was embroiled in committees and what have you and students and I went there every single day, came home, worked at night until one or two in the morning, which I'm one of these people like to work late and sleep late, and still do, and find I'm working a, an 80-hour week to this day. And so I was complaining about this one day in the men's room <laughs> fellow next to me. I, I thought I'd be working half-time or so, and I'm really working very hard. And he, he very nicely put it very nicely. He said, look, around here, either you do nothing or you simply work very, very hard. So. That helped, you know, or whatever, and I, I, I reconciled to that, although I'm not so sure my life is reconciled to that. So that's where I am now. Um, well, do you see any difference between students today? While I was with the government. Um, I don't know. Um, it, I really would say that the answer to that depends on the school. Really, some schools, it depends on the reputation of the school and the reputation of the department and um, the people they can attract. If you attract good people, they're very good. I really cannot give you a good answer to that question. What is it that was your motivation? Is it the publication or is it presentations or is it the research work, uh, the challenge of understanding that? gives you the drive to do these eight hour weeks? Oh, it's 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 the opportunity to 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 discover something, to find something I I uh, novel, the opportunity to exercise your imagination. Uh, publications I must admit at the very beginning, uh, like everyone else, it was important to write a couple papers. Uh, I was anxious to write papers, but when it got past 100, I, it didn't seem that important. And 150, it got to be less important. And um, and yet, it, it's, it's it's odd. Mm -hmm. While well, when it seemed less important, uh, then it became easier to write papers. <laughs> but that is not the driving force. Although I must admit that a nice, lovely paper is a thing of beauty and a joy forever. One thing I, I, I did as an aside while I was at the bureau, which had nothing to do with anything, was I discovered a method of making pure HD, which nobody had done before, by simply uh, mixing lithium aluminum uh, hydride which, with D2O, and this has become the standard method that's used by the bureau standard to make H, pure HD, which had never been made before. The highest concentration anyone ever had was 20%. Well, something like that, which is in the permanent literature, is really a thrilling event. And uh, if you find things like that, it, the driving force is more of that than anything else. Although I must add that now there's an, another, another sort of thing added to that. And that is, when you have a student, a master, a, 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 hopefully a PhD, getting him through and getting him to the point where he can be a researcher of his own, on his own, is a challenge. Uh, it, it's wonderful to have a, a student, student with very, very smart, 
and lots of initiative. And I find that some students are, are, are smart, but really have not caught on to the fact that they have to, 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 to take hold of their thesis and make something out of it. And requires a lot, sometimes requires a lot of, um, of uh, coaching and uh, sort of getting them to realize that this is their thing and they've got to learn how to do research. But that is an added challenge to that. So publications disappeared early, uh, but it, it, the thrill of, of doing something and finding something new is, is really what drives one on. What is this uh, thing known as initiative and can you really teach it or is that something that we don't really understand that much about? That's a good question. Um, I found that sometimes the student will catch on to this and realize, and um, other times you, you almost force feed. You say, now you, now you write this up, or you present your proposal. Uh, but it comes back in not great shape, and the student doesn't realize how much work he has to put into that. So it really depends on the student. A good student is a joy forever. An average student you have to work very hard with. A poor student is a disaster. <laughs> but sometimes the very intelligent in the classroom don't seem to be able to put together the uh, research mind and organization. Uh, is All too true. Uh, in qualifying examinations, there are those who, who have gone through with perfect 4.0 averages who are, who are really terribly poor when it comes. They pass the qualifier, but they are very, very bad. Uh, I think most of them end up getting PhDs, but uh, I don't know what it adds to the, uh, helps them get a job and all that. But it's not uncommon to, to have. In fact, I remember one foreign student who had a perfect 4.0 average taking a course with a new professor who gave him a B plus. And he came up, and the professor was new. He said, how could you have given me a B plus? I never had a B plus before. And he said, well, that's what you deserved. <laughs> he had quite an argument. He wanted a re-exam and all that. But uh, th this fellow was n never turned out to be a, a very great um, researcher. They're, they're, it's not uncommon. Well, uh, Oswald seemed to have the viewpoint that uh, in order for a st the student would not amount to very much who hadn't uh, failed a year in high school or something, who hadn't become interested enough in some particular topic to sort of forget the world for a year. Uh, is how, how is your view on this? Well, that, that may be true. I'm, students differ tremendously. Uh, we have a, you know, a fair number of foreign students, some of whom are very good and some of whom are not. But um, I think the general impression is they take uh, working for a PhD too casually these days. I may be wrong. When I went to school, uh, it seemed to me you worked extremely hard. Uh, but, but, but older people always think that, <laughs> younger people. So I, I think that may happen now. But, and, and my own degree, of course, happened at a very propitious time where it was so easy to find new things, so I, I can't criticize. It's gotten harder these days, and but um, I'd like a little more initiative, uh, and uh, from students in general, I would say. Uh, but every once in a while, you find a, a gem. They do exist. Why do you think it's gotten harder to find things to do research in these days? Well, because the fields that I am in, catalysis, synthesis, chemistry,
coal chemistry, coal conversion, um, some related petroleum work. The number of people working in the areas have increased dramatically. Obviously, when we started to work on organometallic chemistry, there was there was probably two group, two three groups in the world. Now there are hundreds, and funding levels have um, lately have uh, not gone up. In fact, they've gone down. So competition for grants are is getting to be is now uh, quite quite fierce. What was the original question? Uh, why is it easier to find things new when oh you oh well it's it's really it's it seems that a lot of of um, of work you know seems to have been um, attacked by hordes of scientists and. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of grants, really. And when you write a grant or a grant proposal, uh, the competition is so great that you may come up with what you think is a new idea, which in, let's say, years ago, um, would, would, would be seen as a very new idea. There are a great number of people who have other ideas, and the money is limited. And so you'll find that your, your proposal, while rated very good, truly something or other, uh, or, or even excellent, loses out. So the number of people who get funded uh, gets to be fairly small. And you've got to find something that's really, really, really hot stuff before, uh, you know, you will get the necessary money to carry it out. Uh, th there are, though, any number of fields uh, that are exciting now, but chemical engineering at the moment is not one of them. Uh, most students in engineering are going into electrical engineering, by far, very large. Um, things like industrial engineering have come up. Uh, a great many students take two degrees. They go into, say, engineering and law, or engineering and take MBAs, uh, or enge even engineering and medicine, or chemistry and, and law, and, and things like that. And also, there seems to be um, almost a reluctance of some students to go through the very necessary uh, very hard work involved in studying science as it should be studied, along with the necessary mathematics. You know the old story about we have, I don't know the numbers, 200 lawyers for every engineer in Japan. And they have 200 engineers for every lawyer that we have. So um, there's a tendency for people to avoid the hard sciences. You know that we have a shortage of mathematics teachers, and uh, I've just read lately that uh, the average Japanese student in mathematics is uh, equal or above to our top five percent in this country in ability of mathematics. And this particular article went on to say. And the one thing that this country hasn't learned, and I'm not so sure it's true, we believe that, this article said anyway, that mathematics is innate, and perhaps science also. In other words, you're born with an aptitude for, for science and mathematics. The Japanese, anyway, and some other countries in Germany, believe that if you, well, of course you can be born with a Building. One of my sons is a mathematician. But um, they believe that if you take a fellow with some some aptitude, not necessarily great at all, you can train him, or he can, by very hard work, become a very, very good scientist or a very, very good mathematician. 
And we don't seem to believe that. We think, oh, oh, he hasn't done so well on his map, sad scores or something. So he's out. Now they would take him, they still do take him, and they train him, and they say, now you can become a good scientist or a good mathematician. And, and so they end up with many more of them. And they seem to have more respect than a mathematician in this country. Here, perhaps lawyers and MBAs are the ones that get the respect. Well, to go back to Milton Orchin, how would you describe him as a scientist, as a person? Oh, both superb. Um, we know each other to this day. We speak to each other not too often, maybe twice a year. Uh, he's still at work. He's done some a very good organic chemist, physical chemist, that's been prosperous, published a number of books, rather well-known books, with Fidel, and um, with um, someone else in Cincinnati, I don't know his name offhand. Um, and he taught me, among other things, uh, I was a very enthusiastic scientist. And I remember wanting to publish things um, I thought I had a theory as to why this happened. He would calm me down. And he also taught me uh, how to at least evaluate problems to work on, you know, not to, not to attack them or try to avoid problems that were trivial and to steer my, my direction uh, in, in to problems that were look like they have a great deal of promise. And that has helped me a great deal. I owe a great debt to Milt Fletcher in, in every way. He was encouraging. He taught me techniques. He taught me how to think a lot. He helped me. But there's nothing that helped me as much as my experience on the Atomic Project. <laughs> that that stands out to this day. Yeah, and that was the debating or the the debating, the fierce infighting, the, the realization that uh, while you may cite proof after proof, and it really came down to it, there were arguments that were equally as powerful, and it was very difficult to prove things, and the amount of work that was required, and also the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of these people who were uh, tackling these subjects and their ability. Uh, and taking nothing for granted. And also the, the sort of perverse view that they would take of different subjects rubbed off on me. I found that I find myself to this day uh, looking at, at a problem and trying to look at it from the backside of the coins, so to speak. Uh, I think I mentioned that people were hydrogenating coal and I decided that I would dehydrogenate coal. Things like that. But but they all added up. Storch himself was a great influence. I, I uh, would love to talk to him. And uh, he was always extremely penetrating and helpful. And so I was surrounded. I remember I told you all the people that he had hired. Well, I was surrounded by them. Saul Weller. All, they were just tremendous people. And uh, talking with them and having them the ability to exchange information with them uh, was marvelous. It, um, I don't know of any collection of people like that in the laboratory in the government. Oh, I'm sure it exists somewhere. You know, they, maybe Lawrence Berkeley were happy, you know. I'm sure it exists. Well, uh, could you describe uh, some of the people at the uh, Bureau of Mines when you went there, Keith Hall? Uh, Milk Mains? Well, I, I think I told you about them. Uh, Keith um, worked with Bob Anderson, and uh, Bob was in charge of Fischer-Tropsch work, and he had a great whole series of, of Fischer-Tropsch reactors lined up. Um, a fellow named Floyd Schultz, who had worked with Paul Emmett, uh, sort of oversaw the, um, the technical direction and the everyday work of these, uh, of the units. Um, and Keith was more 
um, on the theoretical side, although he, he also took part in experimental work, and reported directly to Bob. Uh, one small incident, uh, they got a, during the war, they, the First World War, they got a, a um, was it the First World War? I guess so. They got a, uh, a grant, a large grant from the Department of Defense to make hydrazine by direct reaction of nitrogen to hydrogen, and were unsuccessful. They later, of course, calculated that it was thermodynamically not possible. But um, they had a test for hydrazine, which amounted to adding some reagent and getting a color, I think a blue color, I do, I really don't know. And the um, fellow named Lecky, who was a very hardworking guy, Keith organized a little group, and one day after long periods of unsuccessful runs, added some hydrazine to the product of good old Jim Lecky. And uh, Jim ran around shouting, I have it, I have it, and he ran into to tell Anderson, surrounded by everybody. Anderson uh, was very calm, puffed in his pipe, and wanted to know just what he did. Although I think he said, you didn't seem to do anything different. Why did you get a good yield? Why did you get hydrazine at all? Anyway, they convinced him that they had him, and he then decided, well, we'll have to tell Dr. Storch. Remember I told you Dr. Storch had quite a temper. And so Bob started to dial Dr. Storch when Keith Hall, after about three numbers, put his hand down on the phone and told Bob it all did a joke. I'm not sure how Bob took it, by the way, <laughs> but it was, um, Milt Manis um, became an expert on activated carbon, did very well in academic life. Martin Elliott, um, as he after he became vice president, joined, I think, Tennessee Eastman Company. Storch himself, interestingly enough. Um, Every time you do well in the government, you know, they transfer you to some other place. Uh, they transferred Storch, as they did me later on, to Washington. And Storch really didn't want to go at all. He had the same distaste for Washington as I had. Maybe I learned it from him. But he went for a year and then left and became director of basic research at American Cyanamid and did very well there. Uh, he was a, a, a heavy smoker. He smoked like a chimney. And um, when he retired from American Cyanamid, uh, he had a heart attack. And then I think he had a second heart attack, and maybe even a third. He lost a lot of weight, I remember seeing him. He was over my house tonight of the Kennedy Nixon election, the last time I saw him. We watched it together. And, um, but he was doing very well. He had lost weight, and uh, none of these heart attacks had affected him, it seemed. And uh, then, within a year, he suddenly um, passed away from lung cancer. I uh, met his wife, and um, he didn't die of a heart attack. He, from all the smoking, I guess, he, uh, had an, an undetected lung cancer, and so he passed away in a matter of months uh, from that. But with Saul Weller, uh, did, has done extremely well, and very well known in literature, outstanding physical chemist. Bob Anderson is arranging, of course, and in charge, I think, of this Calgary International Meeting coming up next year. Gus Friedel, who headed the spectroscopy division, unfortunately developed the um, same thing his father had, um, what's this disease, not Parkinson's, the other one that people are getting these days. Lou Gehrig? What is it? Lou Gehrig disease? No, no. The, the oh, Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's, yeah. At a very early age. And uh, he seems his father had it at a very early age, too. And he 
he sort of had a premonition that, that something would happen, and it did happen to him, which is very bad. Fortunately, his two daughters, both of whom were adopted, so this was not being carried on. But uh, there was someone called Harry Hofer, who was really an outstanding X-ray guy. Um, I really, I really trying to think of other people. Heinz Sternberg, who worked with me, came from Vienna. Uh, a superb experimentalist, absolutely tops. Could, couldn't be beaten. He was worth any five people. <laughs> there were so many of them there. Well, what sort of recruiting uh, approach was taken back then? Today, they have people come in from all across the country. How did Storch recruit this group? Well, I don't know. It was at the end of the war when this group was really... It existed before the war. It existed during the war, in fact. But it started to grow after the war, really. And a lot of them I think they hired during the war. But I really don't know, because I came after. I think I was one of the few who had been in the Army. Um, he just seemed to have a knack of picking people. Uh, and I couldn't tell you, because most of the people, he had a fellow named Dan Beanstock, who turned out to be probably, Epri once called him the foremost combustion engineer in the country. Uh, he picked him up from somewhere. Joe Field, who uh, invented a process for removal of CO2 and H2S, uh, called the Benfield process. Uh, was picked up from Homer Benson. I don't know where Storch got them. And they invented this Benfield process, and there are now over 500 plants that use this process around the in China, Russia, you name it, all over, the, all over the world. And they finally, after making a lot of money, sold their plant, sold their process to Union Carbide for a mere $9 million. Uh, I, I just can't... Um, Imagine he must have had a sharp eye in an interview, I told, because he did interview personally almost everybody who came. Uh, maybe he was lucky, but he, he he just seemed to do it all the time. Now, once he got them there, did he make specific assignments, or was there great latitude in choosing? Both. He he gave directions to different divisions. There was one division that was supposed to come up with whole necrofaction process. And he stayed with that, and that turned into the Louisiana-Missouri plant. Mm -hmm. uh, other divisions, like the one I was in, um, which studied um, basic reactions of coal, basic mechanisms of coal conversion, basic mechanisms of syngas reactions and related to fish tropes. He gave wide latitude, and it was but he would talk to us every once in a while about what was going on. But he didn't, he didn't make us, he had no, um, no feeling that we had to produce something that was going to result in the process. However, when it came to fish and tropes and cold liquefaction, he did have an idea. These fellows had to do work that was going to make the process a better process. So he had goals in mind. But he also had a lot of people working, great many people, in more basic areas. And it turns out, in many cases, hydroformulation was one, the Benfield process was another, and uh, um, Dan Beanstock, for instance, uh, has a patent out for the, um, the um, two-stage combustion of coal to cut down on NOx, NOx emissions. Um, the people he, he, he gathered together were very inventive, although a lot of them did not go out looking for commercial processes. They nevertheless invented things that turned out to be very useful. Now, did he have uh, the seminars that were so beneficial in Chicago, or was this more informal? No. He he did he had occasional seminars. In fact, that was probably one of the things that um, that he could have done more often. There were seminars. Um, 
they were fairly well spaced. I remember I had to get one. I worked in a distillation lab for one. Um, but the, they were they was fairly sparse. Um, and with, but which he attended and took a very active part. If he didn't like the work that was going on, he would let you know immediately in front of everybody uh, what he thought, and he would. He was nice about it, but um, but but sharp. I mean, he, he he didn't mince words. He could have had more seminars. He was not seminar oriented, but we had tremendous numbers of visitors, and what would really happen would be that we would give seminars to the visitors. That was that happened more often than internal seminars. We presented lots of papers uh, outside, at, you know, at ACS, ACHE meetings, and so on. Uh, what was it about him that made him unique in your viewpoint? Well, he I told you he was out of Caltech. He had a, a um, very good physical chemistry background. He had a feeling for people. Um, perhaps perhaps too much in a way. He kind of he let you know somehow or other whether he, he thought you were doing good work. And he also let you know somewhat if he thought you weren't. And uh, I think you could change his opinion. But um, you always, at least I think most of us, had the feeling that we wanted to please him <laughs> and that he demanded a lot of us. And uh, he was very knowledgeable. He did not, uh, you know, he was sharp and uh, there was, a, I tell you, there was a certain air of freedom that he had. A freedom yet, uh, with a ray and a stat attached to certain areas. And uh, he encouraged work. People had, people would work at the lab until all hours. I mean, you could find people who had worked 10 hour, 12 hour days. Nobody thought anything of it. They only had to work eight hours, but they never put in for overtime or anything like that. Um, it was a spirit. And um, he brought the spirit to the lab. There is the Storch Award. It's now a national award administered by the Exxon Corporation for outstanding research in coal chemistry and utilization. And it does, it does embody, uh, he, he was the starting soul of that organization. I mean, the, Bob Anderson was director, Carter was director, I was director. But, he was the, <laughs> the guy who really started it all. And what did he do if someone, after he got them there, really didn't measure up to? He would try to get rid of them. He, uh, he, there are certain people, um, I won't mention their names, whom he sort of traded off to the Bureau of Mines, <laughs> which was the uh, working on mining. He encouraged them to, to you know, to leave. It was very hard to fire anybody, but he would let you know. And uh, the result of that also was there were some people there who did not like Dr. Storch. <laughs> they felt you know, they were harassed, uh, harassed, or pronounced that. Uh, and they were there. And um, since he would let you know what he thought. But he was, you could change his mind, but there were a number of people whom he, uh, who knew that they were, in his opinion, in Torch's opinion, not doing well. Not a great number, because he seemed to have gathered such good people, but um, several left. Who, who were some of the German scientists that were at the Bureau of Mines, or were they well known? Or? Well, the only, I remember three or four, the only name that I remember is, uh, is Donath, um, who later 
left. He was you know, sort of a captured scientist. Worked at the bureau, then went to work for a company. I forget what the company was. Did very well. Then finally went from that company to the Coppers Company in Pittsburgh. Did very well there. Um, so there was. Um, I don't remember the names. I kept in touch with them uh, through the years, and he also was a heavy smoker, and he died of cancer about a year and a half ago. But uh, he's the only one I remember. I did not find at the time that the German scientists who were there were very helpful. But when I went to, you know, the Germans built a coal liquefaction plant during, after the oil embargo. And I went over to Germany, and uh, it seems that they had hired two German scientists who worked in the German plants, because they were rebuilding them, and they wanted these German scientists to help them. Uh, I remember the name of one of them, J-A-C-K-H. You know, I don't remember the name of the others. And after a year, they, they said they weren't helpful at all, and I let them go. The reason probably was that these fellows were very young uh, scientists at the time, and not the, uh, the older people who had probably all disappeared. Uh, so they didn't know too much. But one the surprising thing I found, that a fellow named Wu, whom Storch had hired, um, who worked with me. He was in my section when I was in Washington, by the way. I don't know where he is now. Uh, Wu was not a good experimentalist, but he was a very good writer. And he and Storch published a bulletin, I think it's Bulletin 633, of the uh, Bureau of Mines on the liquefaction of coal. And I was amazed to hear the Germans tell me when they were building that 250 ton per day plant, which still exists at Bochow in Germany, that their Bible was Bureau of Mines Bulletin 633, Wu and Storch. Not the German work. Well, that bulletin went over all the German work and evaluated it. So, uh, see, that's a book by Kroninger. I think, I think there's more in 633 than there is in anything else. And he said, that was their Bible. What did you find was the hardest thing that you had to cope with when you went more into management, away from research in Washington, for example? Oh, I found that uh, there, was, there was a lot of input from uh, higher ups, occasionally a congressman or a senator. There was even a call from the White House occasionally. But mostly, it seemed to be a continual exercise in, in budgeting and uh, a lot of um, wasted time. Perhaps it wasn't wasted, perhaps it was necessary. But um, the one thing that, that I did do is I, is I managed to, with help from John Deutsch, uh, who is now, I think, provost at MIT, set up a fund for university research, sponsored by DOE, which still exists. Um, but I went to so many budget meetings that I really felt um, that I was wasting my time. I got to the point where I just didn't like to go down anymore and felt I was not getting anywhere. Now, when you were back at the Bureau of Mines under Storch, uh, how much of your time would you spend on budget and so-called management type activities? So? Well, when I worked for Orchard, none almost. When I became head of the section, 5%. It was, I wrote one paper for our whole budget. And even when I became director, um, I don't think I ever wrote a memo. Probably the only director didn't. 
a very open place. People there worked very hard. I had no, very little, well, you ran into usual personnel problems. I mean, people had problems and they would come to you, some of them were nasty ones, and you had to handle them. You didn't have those with them to be expected. One, one thing I discovered when I got into a management, and for the first year in Buffalo, I, mean, I used to say, why do I have to deal with these people's problems, with these people's problems? And I realized that that was half the job. And then I was able to handle it. Well, how did Storch handle these people's problems? Did he get involved or did he delegate them? No, he pretty much, it, it, it depended. If the fellow was in a, at, a, at a professional level that he considered high enough, he would handle it. But past that level, he would let his division directors handle them, pretty much. But at the higher levels, he handled them himself. And what level did he get to know people within his Well, I was, I was, I worked for Storch, and I was one of maybe probably 10 professionals, maybe, who worked for Orchin. Storch knew me, and he would sit down at lunch and talk to me, and uh, we had an open office, no way to talk to him at any time. Uh, so he knew me down at the... Just an ordinary professional guy. Didn't even matter whether you had a PhD or not, he talked to you. But what happened was he would he would get to know you by talking to you, and then he would when he sat down at lunch he would pick his, his people. I mean he he he'd know I, and he wouldn't speak to some people very much, he'd speak to others a great deal. So he formed opinions, which was natural. Well how did uh people interact while he was the director there? A complete interaction. I mean, I, um, everybody talked with everybody. Uh, Milt Manis, who wasn't at all work, working on Fisher Tropsch, as you know, uh, worked out essentially the schultz Flory equation. It wasn't his project at all, but he got interested in it. Saul Weller did something akin to that, and even Friedel started working on the fish trope on his own, theorizing what the mechanism may be, so that everybody was talking to each other. I had a wonderful relationship with the spectroscopy division. We published together. Uh, I even I published a paper or two even with Bob Anderson, even though we were homogeneous and heterogeneous. Uh, we did, we had a very good, at that time, now you do it other ways, distillation section. And we used to distill Bob's products and uh, try to theorize this. We remember once uh, we wondered whether you were, you were getting ethyl groups in the first approach. And we, we isolated a fraction that had a considerable amount of ethyl groups, which turned into a note. It wasn't very important. But it was interesting. Ethyl groups do exist. The, the, the interaction was, was very, very good. I'm sure. It couldn't be as good now, and it's not nearly so good at universities, I don't think. Professors tend to stick to different areas, and occasionally two or three will form a group and work together, but that group will not work with another group. To, uh, now, is that uh, pretty much defined by the attitude of the head of the group, or? Is it so rarely encountered that Storch was just a very unique person? Well, it was the lab itself. Um, to this day, uh, the, the feeling, and I've talked to a lot of people from abroad and from companies who go to the Pittsburgh Energy Technology Center, and they tell me that there's a very great opening, open feeling that they get when they get there. They're told, their questions are answered, they're treated very well, they're, nothing is held back. Um, they come away um, feeling that they really learned a lot. Um, an interesting story there, a Union Carbide uh, came along once 
You know, they built the first coal liquefaction plant in the United States, but they built it for chemical. And uh, it cost $33 million. And they came up to the Bureau and they said they were going to give um, $10,000 a year, which was a lot of money at that time, <laughs> to one of the divisions. And they went around to each division and asked what they would do with the money. And I was the last one. And I remember when it came to me, we were working on different publishing in the bin. And uh, I think the fellow who saw me was very crisp, but I don't, that may not be his name. Um, I, I learned about this later. He asked me what I would do. And I said, frankly, I don't know what I would do with your money. I said, I think we have a good organization going. I think we do good work. And your work will simply make it a little easier for us. We may able to buy some equipment or do something that we couldn't ordinarily do. And I, I won't even tell you what we'll do, except I, I can assure you that we'll do good work. And later on, the director down at Union Carbide in South Charleston uh, turned out to be a former teacher of mine at City College. And he told me that the reason we got the $10,000, we got it for 18 years was because they didn't like the other projects, and uh, <laughs> so they chose the one that said they didn't know what to do. <laughs> I hadn't realized that. It was a, a very interesting, uh, very to learn, you know. And uh, they never asked anything. They would come up once a year and just, uh, I think they did it for the privilege. They felt that they, they came up and they asked a lot of questions. And they felt that they ought to pay something for that. That was a of their attitude. Well, what was it uh, that gave, uh, scorched this air of enthusiasm, etc.? Is this something frequently encountered, or is this something that one encounters only a few times in a career? I, I have never really. I'm sure there are many people, both at industry and university, who um, do the same thing. But I, frankly, have never, there were probably two things involved. There weren't many people like storage, but, but you have to wonder how storage would do today with restrictions put on government laboratories. He would not be able to to do the things, to handle the things the way he did then, he had a great deal of freedom. So it was a combination of the man himself, plus the freedom that was allowed. He was allowed, a, he was allowed much more freedom than it's given today. So he was unusual, but he lived in an, he, had a, he happened to be in an unusual time. And he had the ability somehow or other to surround himself with outstanding people. And now this freedom, did that permit him to focus in on some problems that, whose payoff would be far down the road and with the freedom he was able to still pursue that? Or? Well, I told you his, his main goals were the liquefaction of direct and fission tropes, and he stuck to them. But um, there, there were other problems the Benfield process, for instance, I don't think Storch had anything to, to do with it. It just arose from the people who were working there. Um, the work on the Fisher Tropes was done, certainly started under his direction. He, he fought for the Louisiana plant, he fought for the Barrel and Day plant. Uh, he, he had, I mean, maybe we make too much of Storch because in retrospect, the time seemed so great, and he seemed like such a, oh, I, a, a person who was worthwhile working for and who could, you could relate to. Uh, I have a feeling that if he existed today, he might be squashed in the general. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, he, uh, he never went to a university. He stuck to, you know, he did very well at Seattle, but when he left, 
so so they are an industry, and he was appreciated very much. Must have had the same effect on those people that he had here, you know, in the, in the government. Well, now when he participated in research, did he do it? Uh, during the course of the research, or did he only get involved after no, uh, it had while, been pretty well defined? He, it was, he just kept in touch while it was going on. Uh, there were occasional meetings, and he would ask each section to tell what they've done, and then he would deliver opinions, um, yay or nay. A nay from him didn't mean that you have to stop work or anything like that. And he could be wrong, but he was he had powerful opinions, let's put it that way. And he, he did manage to influence you. On the other hand, I do remember people um, rising and objecting to things he said. And um, he was willing to listen. And if you could show that he was wrong, he he listened to you, although he put up a quite a fight. And then I the division or group directors directly under him, uh, were they able to resist very strongly or did they have to more or less get in line? And, uh, well, he never, he never well, um, most of it seems that, for instance, Orchard and Storch, who was my director, got along extremely well. Anderson and Storch got along extremely well. Benson and Storch, when he was head of Indirect, got along well. Uh, Clark, who was head of Direct of Action, probably was his toughest guy. They, they used to fight a lot. Um, but something good seemed to come out of it. He didn't get along with everybody. Uh, and Gus Friedel, who was analytical and spectroscopy, he didn't really, um, he just encouraged them. He did not take a great interest in their work. Oh, he, his interest in their work only so far as it helped his other divisions. If they complained, he would be upset. But you remember, he was followed by Martin Elliott, who was a very, very good man, also very not not the equal of storage, but a very good scientist, and um, who had learned a lot, worked with storage, and learned a lot of storage's techniques and attitudes. And I don't remember who was the next after Elliot. It might have been Bob Anderson. Bob had more of a hands-off attitude. He he felt he had a good group, and um, he kept working on his Fisher Trope all the while he was director. He wrote his book while he was director, by the way. Storch, you know, wrote a book on, with Anderson, but Norma Golumbic, she was, she really wrote it. She worked in Storch's office, and between Storch and Anderson, she put the book together. She was a chemist, I think. Yeah, she was a chemist. Um, Bob was more relaxed, but he still had a lot of good people around. He did a lot of work himself, even while director. The fellow who followed him was more administrative. And there was a slight change there. And then I came along, and while I was no Storch, I tried to be like Storch. <laughs> I never could, but because um, I didn't have his, his really, his background. I was just was as open as he was, let's put it that way. Well, if you had to pick one of your characteristics that contributed most to your research success, what would it be? I think just listening to research and um, getting ideas and translating them into um, useful research. And I think I mentioned it before that I I do this with most everything, even outside of research. I seem to have some kind of faculty, if you could call it that, for looking at the, the backside of the problem and um, 
saying, let's attack it from an entirely different point of view and uh, come in from a different angle. Um, people that never de-hydrogenated coal before, people that never reduced coal at very low temperatures, people had never hydroformulated anything but an olefin, but I, I showed that you didn't need an olefin. Um, I just would would think of, um, of things that were related to, and I still have that faculty, I find, um, and I, I've been quite successful with getting research grants, and I found that the basic tenet, the basic thing that gets a research grant is the idea. I, I mean, if the idea is bad, and you have a beautifully written proposal, it doesn't matter. If the idea is very, very, very good, a uh, proposal can be well or poorly written, but it will certainly be looked at. And, and it's the idea that I, I have, and if, if I have any faculty, it's there. I'm no great shakes in the lab. I worked in the lab, and um, I synthesized cobalt carbonyl for years. I sent it around the world, and in fact, um, one summer, a student named Mike Strem, I don't know if you've ever heard of Mike Strem. Strem chemical? Yeah. He, I, I was making cobalt carbonyl by, in large amounts, and nobody else was, and I was getting requests from all over the world, for, and I would bottle this thing up and ship it off. And I asked Strem, you know, I see there were so many. I said, hey, how about Mike? How about you, you know, shipping these off? And uh, that's where Strem Chemical started. When he left, he said, why don't I? He wanted to go into business. And he had a wealthy father who would put up some money. He started selling cobalt carbonyl and then other carbonyls. And Strem Chemicals, uh, his business today starting from there. And uh, he gave a talk when I got the Lubazole Award, uh, Petroleum, ACS Petroleum Award. At the very same meeting, there was a symposium on small businesses and how they got started. Unfortunately, he spoke at the same time I was giving my lecture. <laughs> but he said, you should have been there because I was telling people how I got started. <laughs> and when I came to Pitt, he, he, he sent a check for several thousand dollars to Pitt. I was there, which was very nice for him to do. And we're very good friends to this day. In fact, uh, I wanted a certain compound from him. And uh, when I called him, I just wanted a small amount, but I needed it. And he said, Irving, we're, we're so busy these days. That I just there's nobody you can, I can take to to make this for you. Um, it was not a hard preparation. He said, and the, the smallest order we can take these days is two thousand dollars. He said we just can't afford to. No, he's gotten that big, and uh, he said the only person who, who has the time to make it for you is if I myself. This is Mike Stram went into the lab and then I said, Mike, you'll kill yourself. Don't go into the lab. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <coughs> later on, he called up and said, uh, "You know, I've been I've been thinking about it." He says, "We've got to make it for you." He says, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's you know, that's strange. That's where Mike, where some chemical came from. But he's a very good businessman. He attends conferences. And he he puts money up for catalysis meetings. So, and then he goes there, and he meets the people, you know, and they know who he is rather than just being a company. Uh, he becomes part of them, gives talks at meetings. Uh, very proud of him. Uh, he's not done very well. What's your biggest disappointment in your career? Gee, Willikens. I'm sure there has to be some. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, 
I, I was the first recipient of the Storch Award, uh, which at the time I got it was a, a hundred dollar award. It's now five thousand, and I w I want it retroactive. <laughs> uh, I won the I told you the petroleum award and um, and a whole bunch of them. Um, I was selected. There is an organization which every year selects ten people in government who have contributed most to the nation. And one year when I was in Washington, uh, I was selected as one of the ten. Uh, Robert Bork, who's, who's coming up to the Supreme Court, was one of them, on the same platform. And uh, um, the fellow on, in a wheelchair who became head of the Veterans Administration was another. It was an astronaut. I forget his name was one of them. And I thought that was a, I was pleased as punch to, to be, you know, I felt I was doing something in my country as they thought I was. I, I, something must be must be good somewhere. And uh, the Bureau gave out two awards for basic research. That's all I've ever given out. And uh, I got one of them. It's called the K.K. Kelly Award after a very famous thermodynamicist who went and went away work for the Bureau of Mines. Um, so I got the Pittsburgh Catalysis Award, Pittsburgh Cleveland Catalysis Award. And a lot of things have come. There's an old French saying, though, I must admit, that says, uh, once you win an award, you will win more awards. <laughs> because I got the Pittsburgh Award of the American Chemical Society. Because when the, when, the, when the committee to give awards meets, they look around and they say, hey, he got this and that award. Why don't we give him one? He must be good. And so it's uh, sort of a... Um, Ball rolling down the hill, you know. You have to get the, you have to get started somewhere. I don't know what my biggest disappointment is. Um, I never expected to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Although, let me let me just tell you about that. Um, when we first started to work on homogeneous catalysis and organometallic complexes and things like that, we got invited to by the um, Royal Society of England, that's what it is, um, to give a plenary lecture on this. You know, Sternberg actually went over and gave it. And we had contributed so much at that time that um, that was that was the most productive time I think ever. And um, I have I have a feeling that in some ways they've been living on that. Time, although I've done a lot of coal work there. I'm supposed to be an expert on coal, but I can assure you I'm really not because there's so many facets of coal that I know little about. But I know enough to be of use anyway. I don't know what. I, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of places that I, um, I don't regret not going into academia. I was offered a full professorship at Penn State. Oh, early in the game, about 1960 or something or other, and I almost took it. My my kids were in school. Uh, I don't know, couldn't have been 60. It must have been later than that, maybe 65 or 68, and uh, 70. And they were just going to high school or starting, and they objected violently when I tell them that I was thinking of moving to Penn State. And sometimes I think that would have been a good thing to do. But I really, I really don't. My wife thinks that that might have been a good thing to do. But in retrospect, I did better staying where I was. I was disappointed in Washington. Um, but Knowing and reading about Washington these days, I'm not surprised that I'm disappointed. <laughs> I, I'm sure there are many. I, I wish I could answer some one question on that. We got to know when we, you know, a lot of famous people. 
uh, like chat, and they went and come over and talk to us about again a metallic thing. Was he was working there. There was a whole slew of, of people around the world who we corresponded with, and it was very very exciting um, time. The people I talked to the, to the fish and trophy people. They would come over and discuss things with me. The coal people, you know, and there was a lot of travel involved. I, I've been to China and Japan, Poland, uh, Europe, it, many, many times. Uh, Italy. Uh, edited two books with Piero Pino of Italy. I knew Nada quite well. I won a Nobel Prize. Uh, Nada won a Nobel Prize, and. He died in some three years ago, and the Italians put out a memorial volume in his honor. And all the chapters are written by Italians except two. One, one they asked me to write it, and the other they asked Summer Jai of Berkeley to write it. I was very honored by that. So I, I feel very lucky, and rather than being, and being um, working for someone like Storage, being uh, Sternberg and I have often discussed this, that there was a period of 20 odd years, what we call the golden period, because we worked with wonderful people, we had a loose rein, we had really lots of money. I remember Mel Newman at Ohio State came down, he was an academic, and he said, you guys have the best of all worlds. I said, you, you have lots of money for your equipment, you don't have to write grants, you just write a piece of paper and you get a rather large amount of money. You have a permanent staff of good people. And you have guys around like Gus Friedel and others who do spectroscopy. He says, you know, you're, you're living in the land of milk and honey. And uh, all you have to do is work hard. And he was right. I, uh, it, um, academia, for instance, is a totally different thing. You, you have a lot of freedom, but if you don't, it's, it's still publish or perish. It's grantmanship, grantsmanship. If you don't, if you go along and you don't get money from outside, they pretty much decide that you had better teach five courses or something like that. So it's a hard life. And in many ways, uh, working for the government during that period not anymore, by the way. <laughs> uh, at least, in my opinion, not anymore. Uh, was it was just a lucky thing to drop into. And the fellow Ben Ferber, who told me about the Bureau of Mines, uh, still lives in Pittsburgh. I would never. Oh, I see him. Maybe I've seen him maybe five times. And all the time. So when I do see him, we're, we're friends. Um, he went to the old bureau working at mine safety, things like that. But I really owe a lot to him because I don't know where I would have ended. I probably would have gone to Columbia and, and biochemistry, which was originally what I intended to do. So I'm sure there have been disappointments here and there, but I consider myself much more lucky than I mean. Well, the organometallic sounds like uh, if you classify things as discovery versus proving, the same mechanisms. Uh, it seems that discovery is more of a permanent nature, if you will. Uh, do you think that that is the way that a young scientist should head, or? It depends on the problem. Um, I mean, again, the metallic complexes were things that happened to us. It was not the our thrust, um, and we we gave up trying to make them. We knew we were on to how to make many more of them very easily, but we just didn't, and we we went back to catalysis. And always in our mind, trying to relate it to fish and tropes. What has happened in catalysis, and John Bradley of Exxon gave it in the last talk at the recent um, conference in Kingston, 
was a wonderful talk. And I think you should have, anybody who's in Fisher Trope should have heard it because he said things that I think were very true, which I believed in for a long time. And he said that the organometallic um, chemist, in many ways, has, um, I don't know what the word is, has um, led, led the heterogeneous catalyst, the Fischer-Tropsch researcher, uh, astray in, in a way. And those aren't the words he used. I can't think of the exact word. And basically what he said is, for any, we talked about this, for any structure that you think you have on the surface, you can find on the metallic complex that will has the same type of structure. And there are, are so many of these organometallic complexes that um, they're not too useful to the to the surface chemist, to the fish jokes person, because um, there are more of the complexes than you can even dream of, it, of things that might exist on the surface. So it's it's useful up to a point, and then it I think uh, deludes the heterogeneous person a bit. Well, who do you think in your lifetime has had the biggest impact on catalysis? On catalysis in general, you know, catalysis is such a wide field. Well, we divided heterogeneous and homogeneous. Well, homogeneous. No, I, I would tend to say, hmm, I don't know, I, I would tend to, tend to say Wilkinson, but I don't really believe it. Um, Chan did a lot of good work. The only trouble with Chan is he was unfortunate enough not to come up with anything that was useful, and he was he had to change directions, and I think the company he worked for uh, was unhappy. He, he did a lot of publishing, and nothing useful ever came out. Came out. What was the question again? Uh, who had the most impact? Uh, On homogeneous and heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. Well, the ones that I remember uh, well, I felt, I felt Emmett was very, very, important, but there was one place that I differed with Emmett, <laughs> and differed several times. Um, I went to a talk, I would go to a talk by Paul, and he would give the Anderson Emmett uh, mechanism for the Fisher Trobes, and I would get up and say, Dr. Emmett, that's nothing but organic lassochemistry, and uh, really, such um, hydroxymethyl things may exist on the surface of the chemist, but then it couldn't be the way in which these things form carbon-carbon bonds. And he would pay no attention to me. I think I, I think that happened three or four times, and he just ignored me. But outside of that, his other work that he did by himself, using tracers and you know with with, with um, teeth and other people. Um, with Cocos, and, and I, I admired him very, very much. Um, I admired people also, like the um, fellow who worked at UOP, Platinum, um, oh, Hansel. Hansel. Yeah. I, I, one fellow I admired very much, and still do, is Burwell. I thought I, I came into contact with him very much, and I I admired his work. Uh, I remember a talk he gave somewhere where it was he had arranged a range of symposium, believe it or not, where Paul Emmett was going to talk on heterogeneous catalysis, and I was supposed to talk on homogeneous catalysis. And you know, it wasn't a contest. I wasn't pitted against Paul Emmett, but I, I was honored by being that. And I remember. In, in his introduction, Burwell saying, a lot of people, so many people in 
heterogeneous catalysis have been working on the hydrogenation of ethylene. And they really worked it to death. He said, now I believe that you can learn much more from a heterogeneous reaction, or a catalytic reaction, shall we say, where you get more than one product, where you can vary the product distribution. From ethylene, you're going to get ethylene. And he said, I think you should get a series of products and then um, try to show what happened when it varied. So he said, I discouraged work by Ethley. <laughs> uh, but Burwell, I talked to a lot. And uh, I really I really liked his approach a good deal. Herman Pines I would interact with. I thought he was a tremendous fellow. He still is. Uh, who, who else was available? Orchin, as I told you, to me, personally, uh, was, um, he may be a year older than I am, but he was a wonderful mentor. When I worked with him. And Storch himself, but, but Storch, you see, was a long time ago. Uh, and Storch was not a catalyst man. Uh, he knew what it was all about, but he was, he was more a good, straight physical chemist uh, who, who could become a chemical engineer, who was practically a chemical engineer, had they easily to know how to do that. I know that I, I haven't mentioned many people whom I have come into contact. Pino in, in Italy, I, I, I have a tremendous um, connections and friends who worked in this field in Italy. Italy really has tremendous, tremendous workers in this field. From Nauta to Pino to Calderazzo to Piacenti to Chiusoli, they turned out some just marvel. They still are. They still are turning out. And I, I've been in Italy and they came over here many, many times. It's interesting how I first met Nauta and Pino, who I collaborated with them, they sent in a communication to the editor, to JACS, in somewhat the same field. I don't remember what the paper was. And uh, it wasn't in good English. So they sent it to me, because they were publishing somewhat the same field. And they said, would you put this in good form? We want to mm -hmm. send it as a communication to the editor at JACS. So I did. And it went in, and then we became very good friends. I said we edited a couple of books together. Um, and I still, three years ago, I, I toured Italy and stayed at Pino's home, and stayed at Piacenti's home, and stayed at Calderazzo, stayed at Calderazzo and um, I still correspond and, and deal a lot with uh, Italian workers and Italian Italians. They're very good. Pino was offered uh, a job. Pino was at Pisa, and he was offered a job at ETH in Zurich. And Nata told him that he would not advise him to go to any other university except ETH. He said that was a place to go. And so Pino did go there, and still there. Actually. So they had a marvelous group of people. In Germany, I've interacted mostly with people, coal people, Burgwell for shown. In France, I interacted with their Sandra, they do, what was it called? They had an acronym, I forget, but they're, 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 they're not interested too much anymore. In England, I, I interacted with, with the lab at Cheltenham and the Cura, British College Utilization Research Administration or something with administration. Um, I know, it's a mixed bag. It does seem like the two areas I'm interested in are catalysis and fossil energy, and they overlap. Right now, I find I'm using catalysts in fossil energy research, heterogeneous one, and some homogeneous ones too. So, 
I haven't told you who I answered your question on what was the most, what was a disastrous or unhappy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there were times where I might have gone to, into academic work. I might have been interested in the Whitefoot Chair, which was once I was asked if I was in, I said no. But I, I, I stayed where I liked it. Um, I, I, when I was taken out of the directorship with Patsy and sent to Washington, um, I was not unhappy um, about that. I, I was unhappy to go to Washington. But the, what, what was happening at that time was just then, I was being told that I have to convert the laboratory into largely a management laboratory. And I was really unable to face that. Uh, I was happy to leave. It, it, uh, if I had to stay, I don't know what would have happened. I probably would have had to leave anyway. So, and I bet so many people in so many different countries, as I told you, Australia, China, Japan, all countries of Europe, and I traveled a lot. I was a plenary speaker at the International Conference on Coal Science, things like that. You know, you know all about that. So there's no good answer to that. I'm sure there's a, there were times I was terrible. I was offered, well, I was, before I was director, I was in the coal, we had a chemistry section. Uh, we, 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 our budget was being cut at Betsy, which was then Kirk, Pittsburgh Energy Research Center. So we went out and raised money to operate the laboratory by getting money from companies. It wasn't the government giving money to industry, it was we, industry giving money to us. And um, Union Carbide did, uh, Westinghouse did, um, Consolidation of Coal did, Ethel Corporation and Catalysis did. Um, we had a whole slew. In fact, at one time, 25% of our budget was money coming from industry. We kept this going. And it was uh, when Herda came along, they said they didn't want any of that. They cut out all the way outside of it. They said, we'll fund you adequately. We really have to drop all of it. But as a result of working with Airco, who, who had contributed some money, they offered me the job of associate director of Airco. And I, again, there was one of those. I, I, I agonized over Penn State. I agonized for two months over that because that doubled my salary. And um, when I could use the money, I, I really worried about it a lot. Whether that was the thing to do, you know, family could have used it. But I'm glad I didn't because a couple of years later they wiped out, as they usually do, the whole top management of where they're going. I'm sure I would have been wiped out. Really.